Welcome to Global Connections on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today we'll talk about Israel's assassination strategy and how Turkey, Iran, and Lebanon have vowed retaliation. Our guest for this show is Rupmati Kandakar, uh, our political analyst, our geopolitical analyst. Welcome to the show, Rupmati. Aloha, Jay, and thank you for having me on your show. It's always my pleasure. Well, this is an interesting show. We're kind of catching up, you know, there's been... Uh, well, I say there's been just a stream of news and trouble out of the Middle East, out of Israel and the assassinations and the retaliation or the threats of retaliation and about all the things that have happened in the anti-Israel community. It's very troublesome and it doesn't bode well. Uh, can you give us a snapshot of, of what's been happening? First, let's talk about the assassinations. What did they do? What did the Israelis do? and how and why? Jay, uh, so many assassinations and all that, but now let's focus down on the three main assassinations around in this time that uh, have led us to come to this program right now and escalated the tensions. So on July 13th, 13th uh, the Hamas military chief, Mohammed Def, was killed in Khan Yunus uh, by Israeli airstrikes. Okay, then you had a playground bombing where 12 children, innocent babies are uh, put to their death. Then you have back-to-back -back assassinations, but within a few hours. So it starts on July 30th, 2024. Fuad Shukr, the, uh, the senior Hezbollah commander, is killed in an airstrike in Lebanon. That shakes the entire world. And then immediately within a few hours, like when you, you're just digesting the news of uh, Fuad Shukr being assassinated, you have the July 31st. Uh, assassination of Ismail, Ismail Hania, who was the political leader of Hamas. Now, Jay, this is a very important uh, uh, put down on uh, the Hamas uh, leadership because basically after the October 7 terror attacks on Israel, this one was the mastermind kind of a thing because you see his credentials are uh, that he's not just a military person, he is also a political leader of Hamas. He has served as the chairman of the Hamas Political Bureau. He's been the Prime Minister of Palestine uh, Authority uh, from 2006 to around 2014, and he was dismissed by Mahmoud Abbas. So uh, when he's leader of Gaza from 2006 to 2014, and then succeeded by Yaya Sinwar, uh, you see, it gives him a very uh, full-fledged uh, a resume to lead the Hamas terror organ, uh, cell. So we can safely say that Israel is going the right way by, you know, going for these... Uh, and it was under his tenure that Hamas launched the terror attack, 2023 terror attack. So uh, what happened in this assass assassination is very interesting, Jay, and we need to put it uh, through because uh, it shows the capability and it shows the, uh, mm, the resilience of the IDF. So um, on July 31st, uh, um, uh, Hanie is attending the inauguration of uh, the newly elected Iranian president, uh, Masood Peskeshian, in um, uh, Tehran. And so now there are two versions to this. Either it's a remotely detonated explosive device, which was planted in his guest house, and uh, as soon as he's confirmed to be within, it's detonated. And the second one, which was released by a uh, version, which was released by the Islamic Revolutionary Corps, uh, guards of Iran, was that Haniye was killed by a projectile, short range projectile carrying seven kg explosive, uh, which came from outside the building. So Jay, something, <laughs> it was like a missile targeting him. It came right to him. So it was not a bullet, it was not a bomb. He actually saw a missile come to him and it was a befitting end after he bought so many innocent uh, Israeli civilians, you know, um, uh, who were unarmed, uh, unprepared for what uh, the end. I think it was the most befitting end to him, which was he was, he didn't know what was, a missile coming to your room was, <laughs> he's out of the picture. So, um, Jay, what happens is, uh, in April, we, we've discussed this in our previous program, that when uh, Israel assassinated two is, uh, Islamic Iranian uh, revolutionary guards, uh, we had a retaliation of around 300 Iranian drones and uh, ballistic missiles. And Iran became the first state to strike Israel in the 21st century. So now this attack, 
uh, Ismail Haniyeh becomes a, a potential trigger for um, Iran and Israel to come in direct confrontation because the supreme leader of the Islamic Republic of Iran declares that, you know, uh, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei declares that revenge is our duty and uh, that Israel has brought upon themselves the worst punishment um, by killing a dear guest in our home. That is his quotation. So, uh, Jay, they feel hurt that it's within their uh, territory. They feel hurt that it's their guest. So, uh, you know, there is a lot of uh, tension in the uh, international community. And uh, Jay, what happens with this uh, assassination is Iran now stands at a point of um, definite retaliation they have to do. But uh, the axis of resistance, Jay, which they, uh, they, they nurture, like I can tell you, is about Hezbollah, Hamas, uh, the Shiite militants in Iraq, Syria, and um, the Houthi rebels. Uh, this axis of resistance that Iran nurtures is outside their borders. With this assassination, Israel has shown that if you cross the red lines, they will come into their territory and do it. If, uh, and Israel uh, blatantly shows that it could have easily been their nuclear site, Natanz, the precision attack that happened, it could have easily been the, any point which they wanted to target. So that shows capability. And the deterrence that Israel has in the face of an attack, it is a, a display of uh, tactics. It's a display of warfare. And uh, the assassination was hurtful because what you do in Israel's doorsteps can happen at your doorstep. You will not just be a remote control and uh, uh, just hurt Israel from far away. It will come to your doorstep if it crosses the lines. That was the clear-cut message that happened with this assassination. Isn't Israel actually um, you know, responding to the, the, the killing of those children uh, in Israel? Yeah. Um, by yes. Hezbollah. Isn't, isn't is Israel responding to the fact that um, October 7th was so brutal, so atrocious? And isn't Israel responding to the fact that they still, after all this time, have not released more than 100 hostages, and many of whom have died or been killed? Uh, so when uh, when Iran says, oh, we're, we're uh, responding we're to the assassinations, but um, in fact, uh, Iran started all of this, uh, and it's Israel responding to Iran. Now Iran, it tells the world that it's, you know, they're responding to Israel. Um, my, my question is, how is the world reacting to that? I remember that our friends in Turkey, Recep Erdogan, uh, he said he was, going to, he was going to invade Israel last week, um, mm -hmm. and now he says he's joining the South African effort at, um, at holding, at, at taking steps against Israel in the United Nations. Um, what kind of response is the world giving when they say, oh, you killed our dear guest who is visiting us, uh, visiting a, an organization, a state that is a rogue state, a state which is not even controlled by the theocracy, but actually controlled by the Republican army, the Republican mm. guard. It, this is a military junta, if, is what it really is, um, dedicated to the destruction of Israel, uh, which has all these proxies dedicated to the destruction of Israel. Um, so uh, do people realize that? Does the world realize that? The United Nations realize that? That, in fact, when they say, the dear visitor who is, uh, you know, an architect of October 7th, uh, you know, should we should all be concerned they're saying that he came to Iran and the Israelis assassinated him? Or is he, in fact, the worst sort of terrorist and he should be killed wherever he is found? Your thoughts? Uh, right, Jay, right. See, the uh, what was surprising in the world reaction in this was that it was... Um, the general public or general media has never backed uh, the Israeli terror response. You know, it has always been the Middle East conflict that we talk about. It's never uh, Israel uh, terror attack. It has to be in straight, simple words that it, Israel was under a terrorist attack. 
that people have bypassed and you know tried to manipulate and bring it to such a soft hearted you know now we feel that you know hanie was assassinated like you said it is what he has been doing he is paying for it is literally his uh, because he was not coming in the grips he is a war criminal to try him in a court to get him to and while he is blatantly carrying out uh, um, attacks and killings i told you he would he faced a missile that was a befitting end to him because he was he has masterminded a terror attack which has gone into people's homes when there are unaware citizens on the streets hostages in the tunnels uh, after 10 months also we don't know where they are what what condition they are in so it's that kind of a uh, situation jay uh, and uh, jay the un security council jumps and holds a emergency meeting for uh, after this assassination and they uh, they try to talk it's it's the most powerful body and it's used to discuss this uh, assassination so uh, when the un secretary general refused to even name hamas in the aftermath of the terror attack so there is a double standard which is set very uh, blatantly j so we have to understand that uh, the international community you have to do what you have to protect yourself now it cannot be iran's right to self defense because if you are not involved in protecting uh, ismail haniya it is never your battle they have not come and taken an iranian citizen they have not come and taken uh, uh, iranian infrastructure they have taken a criminal in the eyes of israel so iran should really keep uh, themselves from dramatizing their response that is what is my opinion jay we forget some of these things are lost in the fog of war but 10000 israelis have had to leave their homes uh, in northern israel um because of hezbollah's attacks and they're still they're still without their homes they they still they have left their homes god knows what will happen to their homes after all this time we forget that just like we forget the hostages are they're still held and uh, let me let me also say that this is just about the time um of of the uh it's a time to remember the munich attacks Uh, yes. the Munich Olympic attacks in 1972 where uh, an, the Israeli team was mercilessly killed by terrorists uh, who are related to the terrorists today and um, you know I, i don't know if the israelis connected the two or whether iran connects the two but i do uh, i remember you know that atrocity and it just happens to be at olympics time and i think you know we were all worried that the same thing would happen again that happened in 1972 so uh, i think that some of these organizations particularly the un uh, a they they don't have a clear view of things because of the politics within the un but because also people in general have short memories they don't remember munich they don't remember october 7th they don't remember that these people who have been assassinated are murderers to start with and will murder again if given half the chance and i thought that it was very interesting in the news today uh that yaya sinwar was appointed the replacement to one of the uh people assassinated and that does not give me comfort how do you feel about that yeah j yaya sinwar coming as a successor to ismail hani is uh, disturbing news because uh, j he is uh, equally um, yeah, he is a you know he's got a mental disorder literally because uh, he was 25 years he's mentally so uh, trained j that for 25 years he was uh, serving as a leader of the majd majd is a internal palestine um, uh, unit which assassinates those palestinians who collaborate with israel so you can imagine how he can uh, he he is so merciless that he can um, uh, get get those people of his own done away with if they collaborate with the enemy with his enemy so uh, he is more tougher and j he is actually the controller of the hostages in those tunnels so by through this assassination of hani israel has bought um uh, yaya sinwar direct to the negotiation table so now you have a person who is directly connected with the hostages to come to the negotiating table 
So that is one plus point that uh, now Israel can have a direct talk with the person in charge. And uh, uh, he, he knows he's the most sought out. He's next on the list if uh, the hostages are not released. So, uh, Jay, it becomes a tete -a -tete with uh, um, the right kind of person because before this, we had to go through so many layers to reach the uh, person who's actually commanding the hostages. Now the real negotiations will start because at stake is his own life. When at stake is somebody else negotiating, um, it's a different ball game. But right now he is he's at the table. So the uh, expect the negotiations to be more straight, more upfront, and I think more fruitful. There was a movie made, Rupmati, called uh, Screams Then Silence by Sheryl Sandberg. And she decided to make this movie because she had so much data, information, proof of October 7th, the atrocities. And so she made this movie and uh, she put it on, on YouTube. It's on YouTube now. If you look up Screams Then Silence, you'll find it right away. And a lot of people, probably a million people, have looked at it so far. But what I find very interesting is that there's been a response to that in this country and in Europe and so forth by organizations that are, uh, that are sympathetic to Hamas, who say that the movie is a hoax, that October 7th was a hoax, claims of uh, abuse of women, rape and torture of women. It's all a hoax. And Sheryl Sandberg is a hoax. So, you know, I find that the propaganda is extraordinary, that they have the chutzpah um, to say this didn't happen. When we all know, we all know, everyone in the world knows what happened on October 7th. So, you know, we still have a serious propaganda war going on, don't you think? Yeah, Jay, yeah. Uh, you're so right about this, because um, uh, propaganda war was the one which hurt the most. And you have mentioned this in our previous programs that uh, they knew what was coming. So the propaganda didn't start after one month. It started immediately within hours of the uh, terror attack. It started. So they were prepared for what is to come. And uh, it was a concerted effort, Jay. There is a lot of uh, uh, underhand uh, um, discussions and you know uh, preparations that have taken place for this attack. First, it was to uh, disclaim Israel's claims that they are terror attacks. Then how do you go to the right of self-defense? People have gone against Israel to the ICJ of the UN. Uh, so Israel is fighting a case uh, on it. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. So all this kind of uh, every newspaper comes up with uh, propaganda against the Israelis. Uh, you have students on the uh, campus uh, shouting protest uh, against Israel. So this kind of uh, comprehensive uh, attack, which happens post the actual terror attacks, is uh, giving Israel a very tough time and uh, rather strengthening it within. Jay. And right now, if you go to see militarily, IDF has killed uh, around two-thirds of 75 percent of the Hamas senior and mid-management uh, uh, level. Uh, Fuad Shukr was uh, the Hezbollah military leader. So uh, it has destroyed Hezbollah's capabilities for um, long-term um, resistance to Israel. Even after doing this, has there been one day when Israel is not attacked by drones? Leave alone the print, you know. Uh, uh, we have well, drones true. showered in every day. It's under attack every single day. And yes. people forget that too. They don't, they, don't, they don't think it's happening and they deny it. It's a denial thing. Meanwhile, hmm. let's look at Iran. Iran hmm. is, a, is a very repressive, extremist, rogue state. And, yes. and you mentioned before Masoud Pezeshkin, uh, hmm. who they said, who was elected recently a month ago, what they said was moderate. I'm not sure he's moderate. I'm not sure he's moderate. I think the politics uh, in Iran won't permit him to be mo moderate. It's not just, as I said before, it's not just a, a theocracy. Um, it's a junta. It's controlled by military people who have nothing on their minds but war. Um, and so what we have here is there are many Iranians who protest. And uh, they have been protesting ever since uh, the time of that woman who uh, wore, wore, uh, didn't wear the scarf and mm. she was taken into custody and killed or died, yeah. um, beaten, what happened? I don't know. 
Um, and then there were protests. She was like, you know, late teens or early 20s. Um, and, and so what, what happened, there was protests. Well, some of those protests, protesters, uh, were found and tried and convicted uh, in summary trials and sentenced to death. There have been a number of people who have protested in Iran. Even the most minor protest results in death, and they've been executed as recently as yesterday. Um, so th this sounds like Putin, doesn't it? It's extremist, right-wing, rogue state, repression to the nth degree, and that's what we have in Iran. So Iran is not a, a, a settled civil society by any means. There's a lot of struggle going on in Iran. And so my question to you is, does this actually have any effect? Yeah, Jay, uh, the, uh, it's, it's the Islamic Republic of Iran right now, and it's a far call from the Persian Empire, which used to exist. They don't have any, uh, you know, the tolerance left. You know, you have the Sharia law. They are a theocratic society. They use... Uh, international uh, the what do you say they they flare it up the international uh, ventures to uh, bring down the domestic pressures Jay. the domestic uh, this this would have been news what you're talking of not wearing the scarf and thousands of protesters being killed in uh, iranian jails and uh, torture just for not wearing a scarf uh, would have brought up women's rights women's council where are they nobody questions these things uh, the Iranian uh, Revolutionary Guard who can use their might against uh, the domestic population is at Bilje. And what they cover it up with? One strike on, uh, on Israel or one, uh, you know, inflammatory um, uh, discussion on Israel that we would do this, we would do that, patriotism, uh, nationalism. And the domestic uh, issues are uh, sidelined, brushed aside um, very easily. And this has been a, a trademark of the Iranian uh, regime. And like you said, when uh, Peskeshian was uh, presented as a moderate voice, this happened has happened with every president that is elected. Remember Mahmoud Ahm ah Ahmadinejad? He was portrayed as a moderate. What did he do? Uh, he um, in the conferences, he if an Israeli uh, reporter would ask him, he would not even acknowledge the question. He would just look at the next. Uh, reporter. So they are kind of those kind of fanatics. It doesn't go away. Just presenting them as a moderate uh, voice with the West and uh, wanting to negotiate with the West, he will not act uh, beyond the uh, wills and fancies of the Islamic uh, leader Khamenei. He will uh, have to follow the orders of the Islamic Council. So Iran having a moderate voice is uh, itself a uh, uh, ironical, Jay. It doesn't work. It doesn't happen like that. Uh, and uh, they are the collaborators, funders, uh, perpetuators of the axis of resistance against Israel. They, he has, they have literally put it down on black and white print that they want to wipe Israel off the map. So their intentions are very clear and they do that time and again. And they used to do this from far away. When, this is the first time I think Israel has gone right inside, into the heart, and showed them that if you do this, you know, Natanz is such an easy target, such an easy target. What about the attack on the U.S. Uh, base in Iraq? Is that, is that part of their uh, re response, mm -hmm. uh, the Iranian response, or is that just uh, the kind of thing that happens? And uh, Americans were, were injured and killed, as I recall, only a few days ago. So they're still attacking Americans, too. Are they, are they trying to provoke us? Are they trying to draw us in? Are they trying to, you know, enlarge the war by drawing the United States in? That's, that's pretty aggressive stuff. And in fact, the United States is responding. Can you talk about that? Can you talk about the response of the United States and how we are um, deploying forces uh, toward the Middle East, as we have before, in order to demonstrate we're not going to take that? Yeah, Jay, you remember there was a... Sh uh Every time, actually, there's a, a show of, uh, you know, a confrontation in the Persian Gulf. And uh, Iran uh, responds by targeting uh, bases of the U.S. in Iraq, Syria, the Houthi. These uh, proxies uh, work more on Iran. Uh, Iran plays a very manipulative game by never coming in direct confrontation. That is their strategy or tactic 
because they always show themselves as the victim. Uh, our guest in our dear home is a, a victim card. It is not. Uh, it is not very direct. They even if when they are, they did not said that they are housing the uh, most wanted terrorist and they are uh, portraying him to be a guest in their um, uh, inauguration ceremony. So this kind of uh, uh, confrontation with the U.S. especially is because uh, they know uh, U.S. will not let Israel stand alone in this and it should not. But uh, Jay, that kind of thing is there when you're, when you're wanting to go to a certain level of confrontation, you will keep on provoking uh, subconsciously, that was that's what happens with uh, Iran. J. It is uh, never going to stop niggling uh, the U.S. bases or U.S. targets. They will always. Uh, Twenty-five years they were under sanctions when they had no connect with the U.S., but still they troubled. This is this time when they have been able to play with the sanctions and get those hundred billion dollars in oil trade is when they have revived the economy. They are very they are very cautious that they don't want to go into another full fledged war because the economy will collapse again. That is economics is also keeping them uh, into this you know a thoughtful stance. Uh, one thing I have noticed some reporters are saying, it's not entirely clear that uh, Iran will respond. They they may have other considerations that make it difficult for them to respond economically, politically, what have you. Um, and so just because they, uh, they, they say they want to respond and attack Israel doesn't mean they actually will. Uh, I am, I'm on the fence about that. I think there's a fair chance they will do some kind of response, maybe limited, although 300 missiles is not particularly limited, um, maybe indirect uh, through proxies, uh, who knows what. Um, but it seems to me that in the Middle Eastern way of doing things, if they say they're going to respond, um, they will somehow respond. Do you, what do you think about that? A few hours ago, Nasrullah, Hezbollah uh, um, leader was asked, what, how are you going to respond to Israel? And the words he used was yavash yavash. Yavash yavash in Persian means slowly, slowly, have patience. So that shows the kind of... Uh, uh, they are gearing up to something big or they are trying to uh, play it down and let time pass and give a limited uh, um, confrontation, like you said. So uh, these two options on the table, Jay, and going for a direct confrontation between Israel and uh, Iran seems to be a um, little bit, like you said, um, uh, far-fetched uh, po po possibility simply because economics matters, Jay, for these people. Uh, for uh, Iran, especially because now that they have money power, they can put their domestic um, uprisings in, they can crush any uprising against the Islamic uh, regime. Otherwise, if they didn't have money, they would not have had enough to crush these domestic uprisings. And you know how a protest turns into an uprising and then the overthrow of regimes. This happens instantly. It doesn't take long time. So to crush these domestic, um, uh, what do you say, disturbances needs money. And right now, Iranian regime is holding a lot of money. Money means power. That is the uh, situation internally for Iran. So get it disturbed by a war with Israel is a little bit difficult. Well, let's let's look at Israel for a moment. Um, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the press seems to say that the Israelis are not, at least uh, on the surface, they're not all that concerned. They're going about their business. Uh, they're preparing for the possibility of an attack, but now they're essentially not, not visibly concerned. They're just going about their business. I'm sure that from a military point of view, they're doing a lot. Um, but the question is, if attacked, and it's Iran's move now, isn't it? They yeah. made the threat. So the question is, if they follow through on the threat in whatever degree, what is Israel going to do? Is Israel going to be more aggressive than it was the last time? Less aggressive? Is it going to turn the other cheek? Remember, there are people in the war cabinet that are fairly extreme also, and they really don't like um, you know, being attacked, and they don't like terrorists. Um, and they may insist, at least uh, you know, with Netanyahu, who listens to them, uh, they may insist on, on some, um, serious, um, uh, some serious responses. Jay, uh, uh, 
to bring to this point, to explain this point, I can tell you that, you know, when an Israeli soldier is training, the Kram Aga techniques and all that, you remember, you must be knowing this, that when an Israeli soldier is training, he steps into the camp and one person attacks him. He fights him. He gets tired. He goes to the next point. Two people attack him. He gets tired. He fights. But he still, he has to keep going on. Then he goes ahead. Five people attack him. Then he... Then he goes a little bit ahead. He's still fighting, fighting. And 20 people attack him. And Jay, he has to fight every one of them till he's tired, till he's um, uh, point of exhaustion. But what happens is the fear of confrontation finishes. The soldier stops fearing uh, confrontation. And that is exactly what the state of Israel is in right now. It has stopped fearing confrontation. It is now used to that, that it has to fight and survive. It's a uh, existential uh, war that they are fighting. And that confrontation um, always um, needs heart. Jay. Israel has developed that heart or courage to keep on fighting. That's why right now also when it's in a state of calm, actually it's fighting with Lebanon, it's fighting with Syria, it's fighting with Egypt, it's fighting internally with uh, the Gaza people and the domestic population which keeps on uh, you know, trying to ask for uh, demands, uh, different election demands, election coalition politics, uh, hostage uh, families, all these things. So it faces as a country pressure from all the sides and pressure makes you harder and harder till they will shine like a diamond. That is the, you know, idealistic explanation I can give you about Israel that uh, even in the face of an attack of Iran, it will continue to hold its own. And Jay, we have seen so many instances after October 7, that so many times, even when it had to stand alone, it has dared to stand alone. I totally agree that, that uh, this, this is getting tiresome, but the uh, Israelis are getting stronger in their resolve yes. one way or the other. It, it becomes, um, you know, a, uh, a threat and mm -hmm. uh, to the country. And, and they must respond. So I guess uh, I, I kind of agree, and I'm glad you're looking at it that way. But, but the big question is, how much do they need the U.S. to do that, to be strong, um, to uh, respond to any attack by uh, Iran or its proxies? Um, money, weapons, um, and, and public support. And will they get that from the U.S. these days? I don't know what Tim Tim Walsh has said about the issue. Um, I imagine he'll follow he'll follow whatever Kamala tells him. At this point, you know, they've got to stay together. But there could be some you know arguments going on under the hood because this might affect um, voting in November. It might affect the votes by um, those who do not support Israel, who support the Palestinians or Hamas, or for that matter, mm -hmm. Iran. So we have a, a kind of, of a fragmented um, democratic response, a fragmented national response. So my question, it's a two-part question to you, is uh, can Israel do what you and I would both like to see it do, that is be strong no matter what, uh, with a, uh, a limited um, support um, from the U.S. because of these political election time considerations? Yeah, Jay, uh, Israel uh, needs to be uh, uh, stronger and continue in this situation. Uh, election promises will come and, you know, the wooing of the public will happen. Right now, uh, I feel the Democrats and the Republicans, they don't know who to, uh, the, the protesters, the student protests, the first-time voters that you call them, uh, they, are, they are so divided in their opinion and they are so, uh, you don't know how to please them, isn't it? They are like those uh, uh, minds which cannot be molded. And uh, so, uh, Jay, uh, protecting Israel becomes um, uh, what what should they do becomes a big question for these uh, candidates who are uh, running the uh, election. But um, you see, when Donald Trump spoke to Netanyahu, he said it would be World War III. So he was very clear in his support for Israel. Kamala Harris is right now new on the front, and uh, to voice her opinion, it's taking a bit of time, but she has to be quick about it. And uh, leave aside red and blue, 
uh, in the election time, Jay, uh, Israel is a strong ally of the U.S. And what happens in the Middle East has direct consequences on American soil. We have seen this in September 11. That is why Israel is so important for America to control uh, these uh, activities in the Middle East so that they don't come up to the soil of America and hurt the city in, uh, American citizens. So, Jay, it's not just Israel we are fighting. We are protecting interests of America, uh, global interests of America, when we are protecting Israel. That is the bottom line. Jay. One thing that this, this whole affair with the assassinations, which I think, you know, the Israelis really are entitled to assassinate those who assassinate its people and, and do mm. rape and atrocities to its people who sleep in their mm. beds. Um, so, I mean, from a moral point of view, they're absolutely entitled, I'm afraid. Too bad we live in a time like that, but um, they got to do it. And maybe, just maybe, it will have some positive effect. But at the end of the day, this whole affair reveals that it is Iran who is controlling everything. It is yes. controlling all the proxies, every single one you've mentioned, you know, from, from Yemen to Hezbollah to Hamas um, to the people who like to stab you in the West Bank. I mean, everybody is always working for and funded by Iran. And Iran is coming out now um, by making these threats, by, uh, you know, expressing its, uh, its concern about having a dear friend assassinated at this inauguration ceremony um, for Pezeshkin, um, that, you know, that, that, that Iran is now visible as the one, the troublemaker. If you weren't sure before, now you can be sure. So my question to you, my last question of the day is, are we closer to a time when there is a direct war, and that would be an expanded war, but maybe the war to end this affair um, between Israel and hopefully the United States against Iran. I mean, fight with them. Um, yeah. Stop them from doing what they've been doing increasingly. On the other hand, they're a big country. They have a lot of people, a lot of resources. Um, as you said, a lot of money, a lot of weapons, uh, and a lot of friends around the Middle East who will be their proxies and help them. But my question is, are we looking directly into the maw of a war directly with Iran? Jay, uh, first part of your question, that assassinations are necessary because these people do the, uh, the, the things like these terror attacks and then they run into rat holes. And then you have to search for them and you have to target them. So that becomes an assassination. If they wanted a full front confrontation, they don't come to the table, Jay. They don't. Uh, they, they make these statements. Now, Iran has made such a statement, but they, they stay back and they don't come for a, uh, they don't call on a full-fledged war. Even when their drones were stopped, 300 drones, only five reached uh, Israel. What did Iran do? It did not back up the plan because they, they fumbled. Uh, they, they went back and they said, this is it. This is our response. So they step back because they know a full front confrontation, full frontal confrontation would just set them back many, many years into uh, Stone Age, Jay. And uh, uh, Jay, they're very shrewd. I don't know how to call this, but like you said, it has to go out for an all out war to bring out these rats into the uh, battlefield because they can't, they can't survive on the battlefield. They like these, you know, uh, uh, hooded attacks. Uh, the cushioned attacks, the hostage taking, they, they thrive on these kind of uh, uh, tactics. They don't, they can't face a uh, full on, uh, full fledged war. A head on war would bring them down to their knees. Imagine, can they survive, uh, say, a Ukraine style war? Can they survive two years against Russia? Can they survive one year against uh, uh, US and Israel? They can't, they can't. So they do these, uh, they will step back, they will now. Nasrullah is talking, or Hezbollah is talking of uh, the response. Why should Hezbollah come in between when uh, Iran wants to do this? So they will keep on running into rat holes and they have no pride. They can bring themselves down and apologize, but 
there is something known as never trust your enemy twice. Never trust your enemy. Once they say apologize, doesn't mean they're apologizing. <laughs> they are just recuperating, regenerating, you know, uh, re-strengthening themselves. You cannot expect loyalty from a certain uh, <laughs> section, which I don't like. <laughs> Life in the Middle East, you know, it's a full-time job try, trying to keep up with what goes on. And it's a mm -hmm. full-time job trying to figure out the, all the disturbances and problems that Iran is is creating. Anyway, thank you, Rupmati. Rupmati Khandakar, uh, our uh, geopolitical strategist, uh, helping us to get current on this and try to understand all the factors and directions of what's going on there. We'll, we'll come back and revisit because there'll be much more. Thank you so much, Rupmati. Aloha, Jay. Thank you for having me.